morning, church. Happy Palm Sunday. Good to see you all. Let's stand up and worship Jesus this morning.
you this morning. Father, I thank you for your presence here. I thank you for these that have come together to lift up their voices, that we might hear your word proclaimed. Father, I pray for those within voice, Lord, that you would bless them, that you would draw them closer to you. Father, I pray for those who are hurting, who need healing, who need your strength. I pray that you would give us ears to hear your message. I ask that you would bless Mark and that you would speak through him this morning. so much for all that you do. You are so good. I pray these things in Jesus' name. 
certain events in our lives that invite us to look back and also to look forward, like birthdays, graduations, maybe weddings. I know I have a niece who is getting married this year, and I remember when she was born, and I remember the different stages in her life growing up, and now she'll start a, a new uh, life with her future husband. Um, the Lord's Supper is like that. We look First Corinthians, it says that, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. As we gather, we look back to the cross. We're reminded of the sins that made... Christ's death necessary. We must face our uncertainty, our unworthiness to receive God's forgiveness and salvation. As we search our hearts, we confess our sins to God. We can also express our thanks to him for his grace to us. We also look forward we look forward to Christ's return, his second coming, and it also influences our lives today. Um, Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians about Jesus' second coming and the hope and encouragement that we'll have. This is uh, 1 Thessalonians 5. For, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. We have that future with Christ because of what he's done for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful to be able to look back. We are very unworthy to receive your mercy and your grace. But Father, we know the love that you have for us and that you sent Jesus and he's completed the sacrifice for us and and made it possible for us to be with you. We also look forward to the day when he returns and that he's preparing a place for us in heaven right now. As we partake of these emblems, help us to remember that sacrifice and that future. In Jesus' name, amen. There are emblems in front of you. If you would open those, we'll partake together. <clears throat> Thank <laughs> you. 
and at this time we come to remember how God has blessed us and there's a box in the back you can drop your gifts and offerings in later well, let's pray again Heavenly Father we come to you realizing that you're the source of all of all of our blessings Lord we want to acknowledge you now we want to honor you with our gifts and offerings to you we pray that they're they're worthy that they're honoring and that they do bless you to know about how much you care about us in this world in jesus name amen <coughs> you to realize that next week we'll, we will obviously talk about the resurrection of Jesus on Easter Sunday so uh, please uh, remember to invite family and friends to join you for our Easter Sunday worship next week we are having service at our regular times 9 a.m. and 10 30 a.m. so uh, you are welcome to uh, attend those services on Easter Sunday the week after Easter we will be having our pancake breakfast so basically if you come to first service all we're asking you to do is instead of going out or back home for breakfast or lunch or whatever you do you don't even have to spend any money grocery shopping or going out to uh, for a meal we want you to stay here have breakfast have pancake breakfast everybody's welcome to stay and eat if you really like flipping pancakes we encourage you to sign up to uh, serve and remember all you need to do is fill out that insert in your bulletin place it in the offering box and that will be going on two weeks from today and another thing that will happen in the week of uh, April 16th is we will start the book of Esther in our worship service and in our small groups so make sure you pick up a, an Esther journal they're available uh, today if you need one they're really thin so make sure you don't pick up like five or six okay <laughs> they're pretty thin it's a, not a long book but it's a very powerful book and we look forward to studying that together in just a few weeks and there's other things going on and we just pray that uh, God would continue continue to bless what we're doing for him in our church and in our community. I'm sure we've all asked questions of God. In fact, sometimes people might ask you, if you could ask God one question, what would it be? Now, sometimes those questions are humorous. Sometimes they're a little more serious. Some people say, hey, if I could ask God one question, I would say, hey, God, what are the winning lottery numbers for next week? <laughs> Other people might ask God, there's an old question. God, can you make a rock so big that you can't lift it? That's a question that people used to ask. I think there's a more modern spin on that question. It's can God microwave a hot pocket so hot that he can't pick it up with his bare hands, okay? So there's all kinds of goofy questions that you could ask. There's also the questions about, hey, God, is there life after death? What is the meaning of life? Why is there so much pain in this world? God, can we start our lives over somehow? And another question that people ask God is, how do I go to heaven? How can I go to heaven? And it's okay to ask God questions. In fact, we're going to listen to Jesus ask God a question in Mark chapter 15. We'll be looking at Mark 15 today as Jesus goes to the cross. Jesus says to what Jesus asks God. We're going to start in Mark 15 verses 1 and 2 and read what's happening as Jesus makes his way to the cross. Mark 15 verse 1. And as soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered, You have said so. <laughs> See, the religious leaders are running around saying that Jesus is the king of the Jews. And if Jesus is the king of the Jews, that, gives, that makes a problem for Pilate. Because Pilate cannot have... The emperor Caesar on one side and Jesus as the king of the Jews on the other side. So Pilate has a problem. The, the throne in the Roman Empire does not have room for Caesar and Jesus. So he's going to have to make a decision. He's going to have to do something about it. Pilate could release Jesus, but if he releases Jesus, 
He will start a riot. He will be considered a traitor to the Roman Empire, and he will be removed from his position. And I count up through the Gospels at least 16 different attempts by Pilate to set Jesus free. But those 16 attempts were all half-hearted because he never takes action. You might remember Pilate washing his hands. Pilate might have washed his hands, but he couldn't wash away the guilt. In Mark 15, verse 9, Pilate said to the crowd, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? See, he's not a very strong leader. He knew what was right, and he didn't do it. But when he asked that question to the crowd, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? The crowd said, No, not him. The crowd said, No, not Jesus. The crowd said no to the miracles of Jesus. The crowd said no to the teachings of Jesus. They said no to Jesus, who was an innocent man. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? The crowd said no. Who was a murderer and a robber and a rebel. Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent. When he asked the crowd, what should he do with Jesus? He only had one response. They asked for Jesus to be crucified. And that process begins in Mark 15, verse 22. Mark 15, verse 22. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull. And they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. This place where Jesus is crucified is called Golgotha, place of the skull. We're not sure if it resembled a skull or if it was just given this name because once you went to Golgotha, there was no going back. It was a place and a point of no return. This is a place where no one wants to go. This is a place where criminals go when they are condemned to die. In verse 23, you notice that Jesus was offered wine mixed with myrrh. Wine mixed with myrrh. That was a painkiller. See, somewhere deep inside the heart of the Roman soldiers, they, they had a, a slight flicker of compassion with these men who had suffered a beating and crucifixion. They said, at least we can offer them something to dull the pain. But you'll notice Jesus didn't take it. Jesus refused it. Jesus had to experience the full measure of pain because he had to carry the full weight of our sin. We don't like dealing with pain, do we? When we have a pain, when we have pains in our body, we'll take Advil, Tylenol, Ibuprofen. But when Jesus was faced with excruciating pain, he passed on the painkiller. The soldiers are carrying out their orders. They crucified Jesus. To them, it's just another day on the job. And they figured out along the way different ways to entertain themselves, different ways to pass time. So while a man was dying on the cross, while a victim was dying on the cross, they would cast lots for whatever, whatever belongings they had left behind, whatever belongings they brought to the cross. Jesus had a garment. He was wearing a garment. The soldiers decided to cast lots for that garment. They were just looking for a way to pass the time. And this was how they chose to do it. But what they didn't realize is that while they were casting lots, they were fulfilling prophecies in the Old Testament. A prophecy from Psalm 22, verse 18, where it says, They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. The soldiers were fulfilling prophecy, totally unaware that this was all part of the plan of God. But we need to realize that the soldiers were at the foot of the cross. They were right there, so close to Jesus, but they didn't really understand who he was. Instead, they were just playing games at the foot of the cross. And we need to make sure that we're not playing games at the foot of the cross. As a Christian, don't play games at the foot of the cross. As a church, we can't play games at the foot of the cross. That's what the soldiers were doing, totally unaware of who Jesus was. Move on to verse 25. Mark 15, verse 25. 
And it was the third hour when they crucified him. And the inscription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. In verse 25, you notice that Mark says it was the third hour. Now, Jewish people kept track of time a little bit differently than we do. To them, the day began at 6 a.m. 6 a.m. would be considered the beginning of the day. So the third hour of the day would be 9 a.m. So Mark is keeping track of the time. It's 9 a.m. when they crucified him. It was 9 a.m. when Jesus was nailed to the cross. Realize that Jesus has been up all night. He went through a trial during the evening. He was praying in the garden with his disciples at night when he was arrested. So it's been a while since Jesus has slept. And they write a charge and they place it above his head because he says that he is the king of the Jews. But Jesus didn't come to fight Pilate for his governor's position. Jesus didn't come to fight Herod for his position. Jesus didn't come to do battle with the emperor over the throne of Rome. He came to set up an everlasting kingdom, an eternal kingdom, a kingdom that's not of this world. He's not just king of the Jews. He's the king of kings. Please remember that Jesus was crucified in public. This was something that anyone could stand there and watch. You know, free admission, open access to watch this man die. Also supposed to be a deterrent to other people that they would not commit a crime that would lead them to their own cross. When the soldiers cast lots for Jesus' garments, that was the only thing he owned. That was all he had when he went to the cross. Jesus didn't own anything else. He didn't own property. He didn't own homes or anything like that. In fact, when Jesus was crucified on the cross, that cross wasn't even meant for him originally in the, in the eyes of Rome. The cross was intended for Barabbas, who was a rebel, who had committed murder. That's the man that the people chose. But Jesus was crucified on this cross that belonged to Barabbas. And as we stand here looking towards the end of the ministry of Jesus, looking towards the end of the life of Jesus, we need to remember that not only was the cross borrowed from Barabbas, Jesus borrowed the manger when he was born. When he taught people by the water, by the sea, he borrowed Peter's boat. When it was time to feed 5,000 people, Jesus borrowed five loaves and two fish from a young boy. As he rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, and people cry out, Hosanna, the donkey that Jesus rode on. He borrowed that from somebody. When Jesus met in the upper room with his disciples, with the apostles, when he washed their feet, the upper room was borrowed. The cross was borrowed from Barabbas. The empty tomb was borrowed from Joseph of Arimathea. From birth to death, all Jesus did was borrow, borrow, borrow. There's still one more thing that Jesus has to borrow. Our sin. Because he didn't have any of his own. In 2 Corinthians 5.21 it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We have all the sin in our lives. Jesus had none. All we have is unrighteousness. But Jesus was totally righteous. So he borrowed your sin and my sin and took them to the cross. That's why Jesus will ask his question as we move to verses 33 and 34. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark says it's the sixth hour, which means it's noon. Usually when the sun is fully risen in the sky. 
but the sun's not shining now. It's dark. Darkness has covered the whole land, and it will until the nighttime. This was not caused by some kind of eclipse or some kind of sandstorm. God, who has power over nature, God, who has power over creation, decided that the sun should stop shining. Usually when we think about darkness in the Bible, it's a symbol of mourning, sin, and death. And Jesus is dying in the dark. Have you ever asked God, God, where are you? What's going on? Why is this happening? Jesus asked the same question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In fact, he didn't just ask the question. It says in verse 34, he cried with a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And Jesus is not just speaking empty words. What he's doing here when he says those words, when he cries out those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's quoting from Psalm 22 again. We're back in Psalm 22. Psalm 22 was written a thousand years prior. Psalm 22 was written by King David. And when David wrote that psalm, he felt forsaken by God. He wrote a thousand years before Jesus, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? His words don't sound a thousand years old. They sound like he was there taking notes at the cross. In fact, David wrote in Psalm 22, verse 16, They have pierced my hands and feet. So a thousand years before Jesus went to the cross, David told us all about it in Psalm 22. And Jesus fulfilled those words from Psalm 22. They pierced his hands and his feet. They cast lots for his clothing. And he cried out the prayer that David prayed to God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Something happened this day. Something happened at the sixth hour that has never happened before or since. Jesus was forsaken by God. And at that moment, Jesus was forsaken by God so that we might never be forsaken by God. In Mark 15, 37, Mark says this, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This is the ninth hour, three in the afternoon. Jesus breathed his last. Here's the man who fed 5,000. Here's the man who walked on water. Jesus, the one who calmed the storm and healed the sick and raised the dead. And now he's gone. He died at the ninth hour, 3 p.m., 3 in the afternoon. And at the temple, the curtain of the temple, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. That happened at 3 in the afternoon. 3 in the afternoon is the time when Jewish people would go to the temple to pray. So did those praying people go and hear it? Did they see it? What did they see and hear at the temple? I don't know. But while people were gathering around the temple to pray, the temple, the veil of the temple, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Behind that curtain would stand a box that they call, a place that they called the Holy of Holies and a golden box called the Ark of the Covenant. And the access to the Holy of Holies, there would only be access allowed once a year by the high priest who would go back there to make a sacrifice for the sins of the people. The veil of the temple is torn in two. The curtain is torn in two to get to God, except Jesus Christ. You don't have to go through your parents. You don't have to go through a pastor. You don't have to go through a friend. All you have to do is go through Jesus. Everyone has access to God because of Jesus. There's the veil in two. We're being told that our sins can be forgiven. Our sins have been paid in full. And that Jesus did exactly what he came to do. In verse 39, Mark 15, verse 39, And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. Truly this man was the Son of God. 
I was thinking about that verse this morning, and I thought, what a powerful one-sentence testimony from the centurion. Jesus is the Son of God. He came to that conclusion just by spending a few hours around Jesus. Very few people around the cross really understood what Jesus was doing. They paid very little attention to what Jesus was saying. But this battle-scarred soldier, this centurion, he noticed with those, within those six hours while Jesus was on the cross, the centurion realized that the real power in the world, the ultimate power of the world, is not Rome. The ultimate power in the world is this man who's dying on the cross. The centurion realized that the emperor in Rome is not the son of God. <clears throat> the centurion realized that the man who just died on the cross, he is the son of God. You know, what was the crowd telling Jesus the whole time? Jesus, if you would demonstrate your power, why don't you come down from the cross and save yourself? And then we'll believe in you. If you'll demonstrate your power by coming off the cross, we will believe. But the centurion was one of the few who realized that Jesus dying on the cross was his demonstration. That was the demonstration of his power. That was the demonstration of his love. We are reminded this in Romans 5 verse 8. Which says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. <clears throat> See, if Jesus comes down off that cross, he's saved. And I'm lost. If Jesus comes down off the cross, he's saved. And we're lost. His death was the demonstration of his power. His death was the demonstration of his love. God demonstrates in public that's why Jesus tells us that we make a confession that he is the son of God in public because he died in public that's why he tells us to be baptized in the presence of other people so others will know that we believe in Jesus if Jesus died publicly then we have to be public too the centurion looked at Jesus and said truly this man was the son of God so when you stand at the cross and when you look at Jesus, who do you say that he is? Who do you say that he is? The centurion says truly he was the son of God. We're going to sing a song. It's an invitation song. It's an opportunity for anybody to respond to Jesus Christ once and for all. Jesus died once and for all and you can respond to him once for all. The song we're singing is called Lead Me to, to the Cross because when we're led to the cross, we see the love of God, the power of God, and the forgiveness of God. And hopefully while we are led to the cross, we realize that Jesus is the Son of God. So if today's the day that you need to surrender to Jesus in this public place, we would encourage you to do so as we stand together and sing Lead Me to the Cross.
that as we begin to celebrate Easter, as we think about Palm Sunday and Good Friday and Easter Sunday, thank you that we have the opportunity to return to the cross again. And Lord, as, as we are led to the cross, help us to realize how Jesus sacrificed everything so that we could be saved. He held nothing back from us. He loved us with unconditional and eternal love. And Lord, we pray that that's the kind of love that we demonstrate towards other people. Help us to remember, God, that while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. And not only did he die for us, but he was raised from the dead. And we celebrate the fact that Jesus is alive. We pray together. We worship together. We read your word together because we know that Jesus is alive. We thank you and we praise you and we pray in his name.